Radio Norfolk with Paul Hayes in for Matthew Gudgeon. And it's a Tuesday, it's after six o'clock, and that means, of course, it's time to meet this week's Tuesday guest. And my guest this week has lived in Norfolk for over a decade now, but he was born a real-life East Ender. He's an author, a poet, and he's even appeared on an episode of Blind Date. My guest this week is Gary Allen. Gary, good pleased evening. Pleased to meet you. Very pleased to meet you. Uh, so, um, you call yourself the Cockney Bar. Yes. Lovely. So, that must mean you were born within the sound of Bow Bells. I certainly it? was. I was born in Plasto, and that's the uh, where Ray Winston was born too. Uh, yeah. So, are you, are you of a similar generation to Mr Winston? I am indeed. I think maybe... I might be a couple of years older, but uh, so I, I don't be- know. I believe, as they say in your vernacular, that you, you, you're from the same manor. Then aren't we you? are indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. A very, very, uh, a very, very tough place in the East End. And, I was going to uh, say, well, in the East End, if people think you were born in, I think, at the beginning of the 1960s, yeah. And when people think of the East End of the 1960s, they they might think of gangsters, the Crane yes, Twins. Indeed, that yeah. Was that the sort of world that you grew up in? I don't mean as a gangster. <laughs> but, but, no, you know, I wasn't a gangster. Of, that kind of surrounding. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You would, you would, in fact. Um, often hear of people being shot and uh you know rumors would go around and not nice really but quite, quite uh, a tough place to grow very in. tough and uh, you believe me you had to learn how to fight you had to because it's an extremely extremely tough environment to be brought up in in that now in that sort of that that tough that quite gritty background yeah it's probably not the dumb thing to say Oh, I'm a poet, or I like poetry, that sort of thing. So <laughs> how, how did that no. interest first come into your life? Um, well, basically, uh, that didn't happen until I was 33. Oh, because that was a lot later oh, on in the story. Then. Much, so, much, much what, later. What were your interests when you were growing up? Uh, my interest was curry and crumpet, if I may say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, really. Oh, and I like gambling. So, you know, that was basically it. I left yeah. school early, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Uh, so, which I'm fairly ashamed of, really, but uh, that's all part of learning, isn't mm. it? You know, I made mistakes, and what can you do? So, uh, you left school early, and, and did you go into straight into a job, or what were you doing? Well, I was, I'd done a bit of plumbing at one point. I was electrician. Uh, I've done loads of jobs. I've been worked in the solicitors. I've been head of security at one point. Um, I've done loads of stuff. And was you that know. all still in and around the East End? Or, yeah, yeah, you know. that was still in, in and around the East End, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when you were growing up, was was music something? Was music something that was very important? Music, music yeah. I, well, when I was uh, nineteen, I I thought it was a great idea to be a teddy boy. <laughs> a teddy boy, you know the. So Edwardian. this was in the, in the in the punk era by then. Oh, it was. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. There was often scuffles with the punks, not with me, but. Uh, so you were a sort of retro teddy boy. Then, I was a retro teddy yeah. boy. Yeah. At one point, I think I'm not sure. It was about. I think it was about seventy eight. 79 yeah uh it, it came out it was really good you know and i loved rock and roll music and i still do love it very much but uh things change personalities change you change as a human being you grow and uh i quickly grew out of that <laughs> but uh the, yeah so you know that was just part of my life then well so well well we'll come through some of those changes and some of those yes. different parts of your life as we go through but yeah. um something we always do with with the guest slot on the program is um we always ask you to pick six favorite pieces yes. was it difficult to narrow it down to six choices it was because i like all kinds of music i mean i, I like i like anything from uh um, swing. I like uh, rock and roll. I like classical music. So I have a, an enormous taste in music. So it was very, very difficult. But what I did, I chose six of my personal favourites. Um, well, let, let's start off then with um, something that uh, you, uh, I guess you may well have heard on the radio when you were a child, sort of growing up. That sort of uh, Bobby Darren. And yeah, why love this, Bobby Darren. Why this particular track? Well, I'm an, uh, I'm a, a big romantic. And uh, I just love this track. It's, it's one of my personal favourites. No, no other reason other than I love it. It's a great record. It's called More, and uh, we can hear it now. More than the greatest love the world has known This is the love that I give to you alone More than the simple words I try to say I only live to love you more each day More than you'll ever know My arms long to hold you So my life will be in your keeping Waking 
Dreaming, sleeping, laughing, weeping Longer than always is a long, long time But far beyond forever You'll be mine I know I never lived before And my heart is very sure No one else could love you more Than the greatest love The world has known This is the love that I give to you Alone More than the simple words I try to say I only live to love you more Each day More than you'll ever know My arms got to hold you So my life will be in your keeping Waking, sleeping, laughing, weeping Longer than always is a long, long, long time But far beyond forever You'll be mine I know I never lived before And my heart is very sure No one else could love you more That was more by Bobby Darren, the first record choice of this week's guest. Gary Allen, who's uh, an author and a poet and a philosopher, but uh, as Guy was explaining to us before we played his first record there, that came into your life a bit later on. When you were were a a young man in the East End of London, uh, you mentioned, I mean, you you had a bit of a laugh when you mentioned a few moments ago that that, that gambling was one of your main interests, but but it is something that that, that can become a big problem for (laughs) people, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, quite honestly, uh, I've had some, some big bets, and I've had some big bets come off, and I've had some big bets go down, and uh, it's it, you know it can destroy you. There's no two ways about that. And uh, and the thing is, if you start to chase your losses, that's what I want to talk about really, because I think that people don't understand. Uh, you know, they they always put betting shops. They they build them right next to a bank and a pub. So you get, so you get drunk, get your money out, go into the bookies and lose it. There's a, I think uh, it's a bit sad, really. There's a, there's another famous Londoner, uh, Danny Baker, who I've often heard remark on the radio that uh, when you look at betting shops, you should see that there's five paying in windows and only one yeah, paying out windows. Of course. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely true. And the funny thing is about that is um, much later in life, I mean, I, I, you know, I had this and I was betting and, you know, I had some good times and, and, you know, lots and lots of bad times and it really hits you and you get depressed and all that kind of stuff. But... Uh, I have to say that uh, much later on, it probably I think it was, I'm sure it was uh, in 2000 and 2000, uh, 2000, what was it? 2000, I can't remember the date. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, but I had a dream. I, I had a dream, oh. and uh, in a dream I saw an horse race. And in this dream, I I saw the horse's number was number four. I saw the horse's name was Tedborough. Um, I saw that I had a winning ticket in my hand. It was 11 to 1. So I had all these things. And uh, when I got up the next day, I got the Sun uh, newspaper, 2-10 at Newcastle, the first race, Tedborough was racing <laughs> in it, right? I told everybody about it, and I said, oh, yeah. you must back it. I've had a dream. And, uh, of course, I put my money on. No one else did, and it won, oh, 11 wow. to 1. So that was a very prophetic dream. Are you a man who generally believes in signs and portents and, and that sort of thing? Well, I'm a man who believes in fact. And if you can show me fact, I'll believe in it. You know, there's no doubt about it. I I do, um, I am interested in, in the hidden things, but you have to show me fact. Mm. You know, if you want to talk to me about aliens, <laughs> you have to show me fact. Yeah. Simple as that. So um, it, was, it was sort of horses that you bet on, was it? or I suppose dog, dog, horses, dog, football. dog racing. No, football, that, really. I, I used to used to do a lot of football bets. And, uh, you know, at one point I did a, I did have a bit of luck and I, I had a bet on um, an accumulate, what they call an accumulator. Oh, yes, where all the results and have to yeah, go. Yeah, that's right. They yeah. were going. And it was going on to Stephen Hendry oh, right. in the Benson and Edges. Right. And Stephen Hendry was 7-2 down, first one to nine. Right. And then he was 8-3 down. First one to nine, and he won the last seven frames off of Mike Allett and won. So I won nearly 20 grand, I think, at one point. But, of course, that's a very rare... Very, very rare. And, of course, you know, the bookmaker is like your bank, isn't it? It takes all your money and 
what you get back is a fraction of what you lost, isn't so it? So do you, do you still bet now then, or do you? I have the occasional flutter, and my missus will tell you she's listening to this now, and she would tell you that <laughs> she stumped up a few bob every now and again. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, obviously, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's something that can become quite a problem. Yeah, for people it's, are, it can. Did you, be a did you big ever problem. feel that it had become like an addiction uh, for you or a problem? Not, for you? No, not not really, not really, because I didn't have to bet. I, I mean, when you're a compulsive gambler, you mm. have to bet you right. have to you can't walk past the bookmaker and i guess you must, me, have, you must have seen people like that in oh definitely shops, yeah. you see them all the time you know but uh i've never had a problem like that but as i say i've had the odd day when um you know you went a bit crazy and mm. and lost your money and uh, deeply regretted it afterwards but you know as for being addicted uh, i wouldn't say i was ever addicted but then again some people might say well you were but mm. i i didn't think that anyway well, let's come on now to your second record choice and um, another one of the, of the classic great singers, this one, Dean Martin. Why why this particular record? Yeah, I love I loved the voice of Dean Martin. He is super smooth, isn't he, Dean Martin? Or was super smooth. Um, this is really is one of my all-time favourites. Um, Gentle on My Mind, absolutely fabulous record. <laughs> It's known that your door is always open and your path is free to walk. That makes me tend to leave my sleeping bag rolled up and stashed behind your couch. And it's known I'm not shackled by forgotten words and bonds and the ink stains that have dried up on some lines. Keeps you in the back road by the rivers of my memory. Keeps you with a dream on the mind. It's not clinging to the rocks and ivy planted on the columns now that binds me. Or something that somebody said because they thought we fit together walking. It's just knowing that the world will not be cursing or forgiven When I walk along some railroad track and find Moving on a back road by the rivers of my memory And for hours you're just gently on the mind Dip my cup of soup back from the gurgling crack and cauldron in some train yard. My bed, a rough and coal pile, and a dirty hat put low across my face. Cut hands round a tin can, I pretend I'll hold you to my breast and find. That you're waving from the back road by the river of my memory, ever smiling, ever gentle on my mind. That's Dean Martin with Gentle on My Mind, the second record choice of this week's guest, Gary Allen. And Gary, earlier on, you told us about how you went through, uh, as a younger man, a succession of different jobs, yeah. all kinds of different things. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned that obviously now you're, you're a writer, you're, you're a poet. Yes. And. and you, you were sparked off into that, that line of work in, in your early 30s. So this would have been in the early 90s. Yeah, I'll tell you. I, I'll run through the story. Uh, basically, um, I I felt quite depressed. I think I'd had a, a day in the bookies, lost a few quid. So And I really needed some sort of salvation. And uh, and I got up the next morning and I, I couldn't believe it. I had, I had this overwhelming desire to write. It was it was incredible. Had you ever and, thought about writing? No, not at all? all. No, all I would write was betting slips. So this was a, this was a surprise. So I went to the drawer. I got a piece of A4 paper. I, I took a pen, and I sat down and I just started to write. Was now, it, was, it, was it poems? Was it prose? Well, was it... no, it was it was somebody was actually talking. So <laughs> it sounds crazy, but anyway, w you know, bear with me. Uh, I sat down and I wrote 260 words right. in front of me. There was no pause, no punctuation, no grammar, and somebody was talking to me and somebody was telling me things about my life and what was going to happen to me. So that was that was the beginning of it. 
Um, well, later on, um, I telephoned a friend and I told him about this experience and he said, oh, you know, he said, you're off your head, <laughs> basically. Um, but he came and saw me and uh, he said, do you reckon that you could do that again in front of me, the writing? And I said, I don't know, let me try. So picked up the pen again, piece of paper and away I went. And uh, then once again, it was two, another 260, 300 words. And I read it to him and he said, that don't sound like you. And I came to the bit where it said, your wife had a doctor's appointment yesterday. And he said, are you having an affair with my wife? And I said, no, <laughs> why? And he said, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, I don't. I said, it's just come through on the paper. So I it's almost like it. the, what they call automatic writing. Where well, no, it was never automatic writing. Now, some people had said that, but it, but it wasn't. It was just basically, um, I was just writing. But it was, you know, I, I don't know what, it wasn't, it wasn't automatic writing like they say, well, you're just scribbling yeah. it down like that. It was just, I was in control. I knew exactly mm. what I was doing. And... You know, and the next minute there it was. So I read it to my friend. And anyway, he said, oh, you know, are you having an affair with my wife? And I said, well, no, I ain't seen her for five years. And he couldn't believe it. And he spurted all his coffee all over the place. Well, that was the beginning. But that was the beginning. And then later on, I just, I was so excited by this development that I kept trying it every single day. I would pick the pen up, keep writing. And um, after a short while, I started getting information that was coming through, telling me to go places where I would meet people and, you know, it was absolutely to the minute, was spot on. And I found it totally incredible. And then I started getting... Uh, were you ever were you ever frightened by it? Uh, yeah, I must have... Well, I must admit, it was frightening, yeah. Because, I mean, where, you know, all of a sudden you start getting somebody appears to be talking to you. You know, I, I, I was wondering if I completely lost it. But when Dean told me that his wife had a doctor's appointment, well, you know, that was weird to say the least that was strange um and then i started getting um philosophy in this way and poetry and i was writing um some pretty pretty good stuff <laughs> and uh and i was so excited by this because the strange thing about it was was when you got a poem for example you'd start on the first word finish on the last in about a minute or minute and a half you would have the perfect piece so I, you know, I found this really, really exciting. So I, I, I went down a few different roads and tried to find out about this. And it led me to people like Keats, Shelley, mm. Shakespeare, um, William Blake, who all had a similar sort of experience. Yeah, although some of some of those people, particularly some of the, the 18th, 19th century poets, we do know that they were being, some of them influenced by perhaps certain substances. Well, yeah. Was yeah. that ever the case well, for you? No, no, no definitely not. I've never, ever taken drugs uh i'm totally against it in any way um so no nothing to do with drugs well you've you've brought in an example of one of your poems so yes i have and was, did this come to you in this way the sort of, yes sort of exactly your, well, they, all, they, they all do okay. i mean this one's called gentle eye right i gentle as a summer's day fiercer than the autumn winds colder than the heart's delay i gentle as a morning may as the spring is sprung as the lamb's first breath the ghost of death shall pass me by, the darkest night and the tear of eye. Shadows fade into the night, the criss frost dew upon the leaf, the quill before me writes. I as gentle as the night, as still as the bird in flight, when the arrow renders life no more. Be as not before, gentle as a summer's day. Is that a recent one or one from... No, that's a recent one, yeah. So how did your, your friends and family, people who'd known you for a long time, react to, to this sort of change in your character? I would <laughs> lost it really, to be honest with you. But uh, it, well, it, I mean, even my my mum, bless her, uh, she didn't she didn't believe none of it, you know. But they didn't understand it because there was me. I, I'm an East End. I come from the East End, you know, from the land of the duckers and divers. Got no qualifications at school, you know. And then all of a sudden, you're writing stuff like that. Did you think at the time that this was something you could perhaps now make your living from, or did you think of it as just a hobby, just a sideline? I, I didn't know, to be honest with you. I mean, my main thing was, was I don't know, it was just getting it out there, getting a message out there and saying to people, well, look, you know, this is the sort of stuff that, that's being produced. I don't know where it comes from. I have no idea. You know, I really don't. It's just, you see, what you've got to realise is that that piece I've just read you, that took about a minute and a half. And I don't need to think about what I'm writing because somebody's given it to me. And, you, you know, you just have to say... 
Well, is Gary completely mad? So, so where do you think that comes from? Then, do you think it's a spiritual thing, a religious thing? Or well, it's a... definitely not a religious thing. I'm not religious at all. I've got no time for religion. But um, you know, I I don't know. I mean, you know, that's up for people to try to understand it. All I can say to people is, if you want to understand what I go through and what's happening, is you have to read Sonnet eighty six of Shakespeare, where he says, "He nor that affable, familiar ghost which nightly gulls him with intelligence." which feeds him with intelligence. And if you read Blake, you read Shelley, you read Keats, you read Marlowe, you know, you name it, and all those people understood this muse. Yeah. I call it the muse. I like, yes. It comes upon you, and when it comes upon you, uh, it comes. And that's it. And how long was it then before you, you did turn this into more of, more of a full-time occupation then? How did that come Um out? Well... <sighs> It's been that I've had it for twenty odd years, you know. But the but the thing is, I wrote my life story in uh, in search of the swan, and uh, in there I had some examples. And I, I you know, I, I challenged the 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 uh, uh, scientific world. I challenged James Randi, is, is a skeptic. He had this million dollar thing going about, I suppose. And uh, I challenged him, and he didn't want to. He didn't want to challenge me. But it was like, you know, it's like all these people. You say to them, well, look, you know, have a look at it test it do what you want you know i can prove it it's a fact but you know that's just up to people if they don't want to if they don't want to check it and they don't want to understand it well i can't do anything about it uh well we're going to hear a lot more about uh, your work and, and what you do now and um and why you moved to norfolk and so forth uh, in a very short while um we're going to hear um four more of your record choices as well we've got uh, four more records coming up between now and uh, seven o'clock uh, but in just a few moments time we'll get these sports headlines with rob i know it's early but i'll be gentle i promise kirstine thorne i'd like to think of it as a strong cup of coffee and a bacon butty in bed a nice little treat when you open your eyes and you might find something out about what's happening in norfolk at the weekend or somebody who's doing something amazing in norfolk saturday breakfast yeah i suppose i am a little bit on the nosy side but then that's what we're here for isn't it saturday breakfast with Kirstine Thorne on BBC Radio Norfolk. You're part of the BBC. Yep, Kirstine, now the new voice of Saturday mornings from 6 till 9 here on BBC Radio Norfolk. Right now, the time is 6.30 and the voice of the sports desk is Rob Butler. Thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, in a moment we'll head over to get the latest on Norwich City's game tonight. But first, Pakistan will have an uphill task to get anywhere near England's world record total of a 444. That's at the third ODI in Nottingham. Guy Swindles is there for us. It's pretty tough when you're setting out and you know you need to break the world record simply to uh, win a match that you need to if you're to stay in this Royal London series. But that is the task taking Pakistan. Uh, they have had a moment of luck, the very first ball of their innings. If England had reviewed the not-out decision uh, for LBW against Sami Aslam, well, the replays would have showed about hitting halfway up middle. As it is, though, he survived, and Pakistan are six without loss in the second innings, chasing 445 for victory after Joss Butler, with the last ball of the innings, broke the previous record of 443. Uh, Butler also recorded the fastest ever half-century by an Englishman in a one-day international of just 22 deliveries and Alex Hales, 171, the highest ever scored by an Englishman in a 50-over match. So, uh, brilliant afternoon so far. Pakistan, I think it's fair to say, with their work cut out. Very much so, yeah. Thanks very much to the guy. Back with him later on in our sports programme tonight. Now we're off to Peterborough and the first round of the Checker Trade Trophy. It's for Norwich's under-23s. Chris, Chris Gorham should be there. And Chris, hopefully you've got just about got the team news for us. Yes, uh, good evening from London Road where they're watering the pitch and uh, there's a rather a low-key atmosphere ahead of uh, Peterborough United against Norwich City's under-23s. The team news just been announced. I can tell you that in terms of senior players for Norwich today, uh, Tony Andrew, the, the French midfielder, is, is the, the most senior player in terms of age. Josh Murphy in the starting lineup as well. This is the team that Norwich have gone with. Ben Killip, the goalkeeper. Uh, Lewis Ramsey, Ben Godfrey, Michi Effete and Harry Toffolo at the back. Tony Andrew and... Uh, uh, Lewis Thompson playing in midfield with uh, Ray Grant, uh, Josh Murphy and James Madison behind Carlton Morris in attack. That is the Norwich City team news just confirmed. So uh, in terms of senior players, um, Rob, players like Michael Turner, Sebastian Bassong, we thought might get a run out tonight. Well, they haven't. It is pretty much uh, a, a very young Norwich City side. They're all under 23 in that starting lineup, except for Tony Andrew. Granddad Andrew, as they'll be calling him in the dressing room before this one. 
Brilliant stuff. Thanks very much to Chris Gore. I'm back with him around about 7 o'clock. Um, we'll be live on air for full match coverage. Peterborough United versus Norwich City's under-23s. Back to you, Paul. Rob, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, that coming up in uh, programme starts at 7 o'clock. It is 6.32. You're listening to the Tuesday Guest Slot with Paul Hayes in for Matthew Gudgeon. And my guest this week is the author and poet Gary Allen. And Gary, we're coming up to your uh, third record choice yes. of the evening now. And um, this one, I believe, is well, you mentioned earlier that uh, the reason why you moved to Norfolk yes. and getting married was all, all, all connected. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this this song is, is, I believe, connected with your wedding. So first of all, um, we'd better ask about Mrs. Allen Shona. Yes, uh, indeed. How did the two of you meet? My beautiful wife. Um, well, uh, that's another strange thing. It's a long story. I won't go into it. I will tell you just briefly that I saw a picture of her. And from that picture, I was given, intuitively, the date of our wedding, which was the 23rd of April 2004. I was given the date of our engagement, which was the um, uh, 20, uh, February the 24th, uh, 2003. And uh, never had a single date, and we've been married for 12 years. So... Who who showed you the picture of her? Where did you see the picture of her? Well, Shona sent me an email, but, you know, that, that, that then brings in a... It, it, the story goes way, way back. It, I met a woman on a train, believe it or not. And uh, I'm sitting in it opposite this woman on a train, and I, and I kept getting his voice in my head. And his voice was saying to me, tell her Peter. Tell her Peter. And then a third time it said, tell her Peter. And I thought, well, I've got to tell her now. So I said to this woman, do you know Peter? And this woman said, yeah, he's my boss. And she gave me her card. She got off the very next stop. She, we became great friends. She moved to Norfolk. And uh, it's a long story, but anyway, it was via her that uh, I actually got in touch with this other lady who had met Shona, yeah. Oh, so it's all very long. Now, I oh, do, I long do know, because you, you told me an email you sent me with a few notes about yeah. things we can maybe talk about, that, that you had been, you were on blind date once, weren't you? Oh, so, yes. But it wasn't, but, but, so you didn't meet Shona on blind no, date? No, I didn't meet Shona. No, no, no. That was, uh, oh, that was in my brush days. Um, I met Scylla Black and uh, swept her off her face. So were you the one choosing, or were you one of the no, three I was options? No, I was one of the guests. You know, at that time, blind date was extremely popular. Yeah, it was one of the hugely oh, popular God, program, it, wasn't it? it yeah. yeah, and it was apparently a 70 to one chance, 70,000 to one chance of actually getting picked so i met greg dyke and i've done yes. a few impersonations so that's running, where he's running lw he was yeah there. and uh anyway i you know i got I got a phone call and they said we'd like you on the show and i went on it and uh did myself justice but i didn't get picked you didn't because, get picked oh, no. no no it was very sad because funny enough the very next week the the, the girl didn't like my cockney accent so oh. she, she was rather posh but Never mind. But the following week, there was someone called Claudia on. Right. And uh, she was a, a, a big cutter lady, big black lady. And she was a scream, but she was a cockney. And I thought, well, if I'd have gone on a date with her, we could have tore the ass yeah. down. It was brilliant. Do you find, that, brilliant. But do you find that people are kind of judgmental about Oh, definitely. The oh, definitely. You know, whenever you, were, you, whenever you went for a job, you know, speaking... I mean, actually, I, I went to London recently and people were saying... You know, you've got a bit of a Norfolk twang. <laughs> I don't know where. Can I, I just say not. I don't think the people listening on BBC Street in Norfolk are going to no, think that. No, no, I don't know. So, I, you know, but uh, no, it, it does affect you, you know. But um, you know, it's a bit of a barrier to overcome, you know, when people listen to you. But uh, that's why they're, they're. I mean, I went to this. I got invited to this poetry evening, and uh, the people. I don't know what they was expecting me to read, but I read one of my poems called Beauty, and. Uh, and I, no one clapped, no one oh, applauded. Dear. It was like a tumbleweed moment. And I thought to myself, well, what's wrong with them? But they didn't expect it. Mm. You know, they totally didn't expect People what, don't expect a Cockney poet, I guess. No, yeah. they don't. No, well, um, actually, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Just going to say to you that there is actually now free Cockney bars. I've become ever popular because I, two other people have decided that they like my name. So oh, if right. anyone does look me up, uh, they just have to look for, you know, www.thecockneybar.com. <laughs> And I'm the intuitive one. Right. You know. so, so it's, it's like a trademark dispute going yeah, on among the well, cotton Well, you know, if people want to um, use that, I don't know. But we, meant, you meant, we mentioned about, so you, you, you uh, married Shona in yes. 2004. Yes, indeed, yeah. Uh, and was this song played at your wedding, was it? Or? It was, Elizabethan Serenade, yeah. Absolutely beautiful, love it. Love uh, it, yeah. By, uh, I don't know this one, I have to confess, is it Ronald Binge? Ronald Binge. 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 Um, yeah, uh, I, I think it's a Polish orchestra, but it, it's, a, it's a wonderful track, and... It always reminds me, of, we, had a, we had a televised wedding. It was televised by East Anglia East, and it was televised by uh, ITV. 
Uh, we had a medieval wedding. Absolutely oh, right. fantastic. So they came and filmed it for the news, did they? Oh, they? yeah, yeah. It was a fantastic wedding. Where, we where, was, that? where was that? That was oh, in 2004. Where, where was it, though? Where did it take uh, place? That was in in the village of Hayden. We oh, had okay. It, yeah. And uh, it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic wedding we had. Because themed people, I guess, a bit more aware of themed weddings these days. But oh yeah, a bit rarer. Well, it was a, it was a bit sad because we had our. I was dressed as a Knights Templar. We had our wedding. We put it online, uh, you know, thinking to share it. How wonderful it was to share it, and it got hijacked by the right, the far right. So, oh dear. Oh dear, yeah. So we had over five thousand hits in about two days. But it wasn't quite what we wanted, so we had to take the video down. It was very sad. It's very yeah. odd. Yeah, very sad. Well, hopefully this can be a happier yes. memory of your wedding. Yes. This is uh, Elizabethan Serenade. Here we go. That's Elizabethan Serenade by uh, Ronald Binge, the third record choice of my guest this week, Gary Allen, and one that reminds him of his um, medieval-themed wedding at Hayden in... Uh, it's, it's sort of North Norfolk, isn't it, Hayden? North Norfolk, yeah. 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 North and is that, is that where you live now, North Norfolk, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, a little bit yeah. North Norfolk, yeah. And uh, So uh, part of the world that you, you enjoy being... Because, I mean, do you miss yeah. the East End? More, or? No, I don't miss the East End. I, w I was there, you know, I was there recently, but... Uh, no, I don't. It's changed beyond all recognition. Uh, the, the, you know, it, when I was growing up, you you still had, you, you know, you couldn't really leave your door open. I mean, <laughs> that's going back a bit further than, than me, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't bad. And you used to know the neighbours and everything. But now I don't think people know their neighbours. It's the the whole mm. ethos of the East End. The only thing that's still going is pie and mash shops. Love a bit of pie and mash. Yeah. But that's the only thing that's going. And uh, it's very sad to see it, actually. It's very sad. Well, I suppose all places spirit. change over time, well, they do. don't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of the East Enders have moved out. Uh, I mean, they used to have the East End markets. Um, I think they're still going, but well, as they we have know, changed. See it's from culturally changed. East Enders, we see, don't we? It's all themed oh, around yeah. the Market Square, but <laughs> oh, East Enders. Yeah. What, do, what, do you make, what do you make of East Enders? That's not a, real a lot. Life East not a lot. Uh, oh, well, you know, some of the characters in it are portraying like. The, the way it is but I think in its early days it was seen as being perhaps a more realistic yeah, depiction of life you know, it was, but, but you know it, in the East End you would get people come around and knock on your door and say you know do you want to buy a telly and you want to yeah. you want to buy a, a cassette recorder and that kind of stuff sounds more like a sort of Arthur Daly it or, was, or it, Only Falls and Horses it was, yeah than, indeed yeah, it yeah. was an Arthur Daly thing and uh, you know someone was once selling uh, Lacoste uh, jumpers and uh, someone pointed out and said oh you know they're not genuine ones they said how do you know that and then they said because the crocodile was upside down <laughs> <laughs> oh you know just funny stories but that that you know that's what it was like in the east end but you, you enjoy know. the more sort of the more rural life in North i North do North. i love the country life i yeah i do i i love all that and I, I i can't stand london when i go back down there because it's so busy hurly burly and you know it, it has quite an aggressive feel to it Unfortunately, but you like the more relaxed pace. In oh North yes, North, definitely. Okay. Yes, I do. I do indeed. Yeah, like the uh, relaxing, relaxing life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Not everyone's cup of tea, though, is it? But no, a bit worse. Different things suit different yeah. people, don't they? Um, now, your fourth record choice uh, takes us uh, away from London, away from North Norfolk, away from the country to Mexico. Why this particular oh, one? Oh yes. Well, I I I like Roger Whittaker. I mean, he won't be everyone's cup of tea, but. Uh, I think this one was from '69 or '68, something like that. So when you were quite quite a young child. At the time, yeah, right? well, I was well, I was 18. Uh, but um, it's just a record that I heard once, uh, and I've heard it many, many times since. Never get tired of it. 
Well, this is Mexican Whistler by Roger Whittaker. <laughs> That's Mexican Whistler by Roger Whittaker, the fourth record choice of my guest this week, the author and poet Gary Allen. And Gary, a little early when we were talking about your poetry and your, your influences and yeah. so forth, um, you, you mentioned uh, briefly uh, Shakespeare. Yes. Um, when did Shakespeare first? When did you first get interested in Shakespeare? Well, Shakespeare, that, this is a this is a, a, a this a, a, an amazing really. But uh, I was thirty three years of age. Um, I discovered I had disability, if some people call it a gift, mm. uh, an intuitive thing, whatever. Um, I just have to point out to the audience that I'm not interested in the paranormal and all that kind of stuff. I'm not yeah. interested in new age stuff, but I am interested in the mind. I've been studying the mind for about 20 years, and that's what interests me. Um, uh, basically, uh, when I when I discovered I had disability, uh, I phoned a friend up and read him some of the poetry, and he said... He said, some of it sounds like Shakespeare. And I said, who's Shakespeare? I had no idea. And I was 33 years of age. Can you You're believe that? Are you saying you'd never even heard of Shakespeare? I am telling you that. I had never heard of Shakespeare. You'd, you'd, you'd I, grown I up to, in the UK for 33 uh, years. I am you'd serious. Never heard of I am serious. Whether it was completely, you know, the, you know, I don't know. When I went to comprehensive school, it was sort of maybe that was something that would have been studied for an A-level. Yeah. Of course, I was expelled. So I didn't reach, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't reach those off the ice. But... I have to say that, you know, if, if I did hear it or it was anywhere, mm. I'd completely forgotten well, about it. It had gone completely out of my head. Yeah. Um, I had so no you, idea. So you started looking into him. Did That's you? right. Mm. And he said, and then he, I read him a thing and he said to me, oh, I'm going to, he said, you don't know Shakespeare? He said, are you sure? And I said, I've never heard of him. And then he said, what about Sonnet? And I said, what's a Sonnet? I had no idea what a Sonnet was, right? So he, he couldn't believe it. And he came back on the phone and he read me Sonnet 144, Two Loves I Have of Comfort and Despair. And when people understand that, there's a lot of experts who, who you know, say, oh, you know, it's about the dark lady, it's about his gay lover, and it, this is nonsense. What it really is about is about the mind. It's about aspects of the mind. The good angel and the dark angel, you know, and that is what that's about. And uh, so anyway, but that's, that's down to people, so they can make their own what they want to believe it is, but I know it is about the mind. And it's about understanding. And when you get an understanding of Keats, Shelley, Blake, uh, Marlowe and all the others, and you begin to research them and understand it, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, you're, you're writing a book to do it. Yes, I'm writing right? a book. Uh, it's called Much Ado About Something, uh, The Untold Shakespeare. And uh, in that book, I will reveal a couple of most astounding, and I mean astounding things, that will rock people uh, who, who believe in Shakespeare and everything, it will absolutely rock them to the core. I'm in, telling in, you. In what way? Well, I'm not going to reveal. <laughs> I'm not going to reveal it. But I'm just other than to say. Is that sort of historical facts about his life? These, these are is something that I was I was led to. Um, it's something I found, and it's all provable. It's not some figment of imagination. Like the interesting thing about when you get these. These people, they are Baconians, they are Marlovians, they are Shakespeareans. There's, there's, there's people who claim as well that oh. Shakespeare didn't actually write well, the... Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this, is what, this yeah. is what some people claim. But, you know, 
to me, when someone said to me, what is truth to you? They said to me, what is truth? And I say, truth has no flaws. So if there's a flaw in your story, then <laughs> yeah. it's not true, right? No, it's not truth. So I basically, anyway, but um, I've, I've talked to all these people, the Baconians, the Marlovians, and they've all got aspects that are fact. But there's a flaw in each of their cases, like the Earl of Oxford. There's a flaw in that. There's mm. a flaw. There's even a flaw in Shakespeare, right? And and I will reveal this in in the book, which is coming out soon, in a, probably a couple of weeks or so. All right. But I will I will show people, you know, what I'm talking about in that in that oh, book. Okay. It's, it's fascinating. Well, we can we can look forward to that. You You've got, got a good trail for it there. To be or not to be. Yeah, <laughs> no, indeed. Uh, now, <laughs> speak, speaking of verse, so yes. you've got another little poem. I have indeed. I, yes. um, I have a poem, and it's called "Such Beauty." Wherever your beauty to smile. Tis more the sanity of mind deceived, and yet were it ever to please a face of such beauty, were ever more beauty to touch and grace so sweet a charmed face, where heaven did smile before thee in celebrated glee, O oh, see with eyes in whisper silent verse, a magical spell never to seek or tell a beauty's tale, fortunes bless thy skin so fair, and words the poet speak so well, voice thy beauty's fallible hell, never thus to shame the rose, but thus he did compare. "'Twas beauty bound upon thy lips "'that ever more a pleasure shared "'than eyes did ever see such beauty.'" There we are. People can make of that what they will. Make of it what you will. Make uh, of it what you will. Now, we mentioned a little earlier that uh, you live in North Norfolk now. Yes. And I believe something that uh, you're very enthusiastic about every year is people. a lot of people know that the um, the North Norfolk Railway, they have the, the big 1940s oh, yes. weekender, don't they? Yes, they have. Oh, it's fantastic. We enjoy that. We dress up. Uh, you know, I dress up as a GI and my wife is always beautifully turned out. Um, and we have such a great time. And all the people of Norfolk and everything, they all dress up and... Uh, and if anyone sees me there with my beautiful wife, please come over, have a chat. You know, I don't bite on nothing. You'll be, you'll be the world's friendly. only, you'll be the world's only Cockney GI. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But you get the girl. That's the main thing, isn't it? <laughs> what does Shona dress up as? Uh, oh, she's always looked beautiful. You know, she dresses in in the vintage clothing, and uh, you know, she's a she's a very stunning looking girl anyway. But uh, she's she's a forties. 50s pin up oh, okay. you know anybody who knows and knows uh she has that look about her so um you know she'd probably be cringing at the moment with me <laughs> saying all this <laughs> but the reason we mention it is because it ties in with your fifth record yes yeah. which is a, a 1940s themed track is it what's, yes what's this one? Oh, i love this one uh, uh, glenn miller did a version but i think uh, the squadroneers is a is a better version and it's american patrol <laughs> That's the Squadron Airs with their version of American Patrol, the fifth and penultimate record choice of this week's guest, Gary Allen. And Gary, when I introduced you at the beginning of the programme, I said that uh, you're an author and a poet. Yes. And something we haven't really touched on, a philosopher, philosopher. as well. Yes, so indeed. How, uh, it can be quite a difficult thing to define a philosopher. <clears throat> well, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. Someone once said to me, well, there's no need for a philosopher these days. I said, there's always a need for philosophers. Um, so what is a philosopher? How would you define being a philosopher? Well, a deep thinker. 
And um, I, I've written hundreds of uh, philosophical quote, quotes, etc. So, and people, if they want, if they're interested in my poetry and uh, my philosophy, they can go online at uh, www.thecockneybardphilosophia.com, and there's all the work there, all the channeled material. And um, I mean, basically, is there a point where they can blur and where poetry can be philosophy and they can sort of blur? Yes, and cross definitely, over? definitely. I, I'll, I'll read you something in a minute where where you know you you'll understand that point what you're saying. It, of course, it can, but uh, you know, if you you love Plato and Socrates and that sort of stuff. And, uh, he played for Brazil, didn't he? <laughs> he certainly did. Yeah, but you know, I love, I love it. I love the deeper, the deeper the thinking, the more I love it. And okay. I'll just uh, read you, yeah, give us an example. Read you this this example, and it's uh, called "Love Is." When all the winds have calmed, the sea waves crash against the shore no more. The sun flickers its light against the dying embers of a man's last breath. I shall remember only one thing: I loved, was loved and knew what love was. And was that something, again, that sort of was... You talked about almost sort of dictated to you by exactly. the voice in your head? Exactly. I, I hear the voices. The voices give me this information. I mean, I've written an ode, what, something, I've written an ode to Shakespeare. I've written a poem called The Poppy. War poems, Lost in the Winds That Blow. I've written poems on all manner of subjects, even a, 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 a poem on gays. Uh, it's just that what happens is that I get inspired... And, and, you know, from start to finish, you know, it's like a, a minute or a minute and a half. And there is an interesting thing about Shakespeare when people are talking about this kind of stuff is that um, it was said that whatever he wrote, he never blotted a line, right? And when I write, I never blot a line. I mean, Dad, You have because, got a couple of crossings out yeah, in front but of you. That, no, that but this is, this is an old poem. But the originals, if, yeah. if people go onto my website, uh, cockneybard.com, I'll yes. get that in again. Yes. But if you go onto that website, you will see original examples of the philosophy and poetry, and you will see uh, the original writings, and there's no crossing out or anything. Then. I feel as if being in the BBC, I should say other Cockney poet philosophers are available, but there probably yes, aren't that many of them. <laughs> uh, now... Um, we're going to hear your final record choice yes. in a couple of minutes' time. Yes. But before that, um, there's a special reason why you chose the final piece today, isn't yes, there? Yes, there is. Um, just recently, uh, I lost my mum, unfortunately. Um, I love my mum dearly. Um, I'm very proud that I was able to carry the coffin. It was one of the proudest days of my life. Um, you know, and this is just a, a recent thing, the last two months. Devastated is, is probably uh, too... Uh, you know, weaker word for it. Um, but it's something that we all must go through. And, you know, I've written poems on death and, and uh, we all have to face it. And, um, you know, I, I, I know from now losing a parent what it's like. I, I dare not think what it's like to lose a child. I can't imagine it for one minute. Um, but she was a beautiful woman, my mum, and uh, I love her dearly. And even though I, I strongly believe in life after death, because it has been proven to me, I would still say that the pain is no less. And so why was this particular track that we're going to finish with? Why, why is this it's one? It's just a beautiful song. And, and I, <clears throat> you know, I, I think whenever you hear it, I have um, my, my son is, is part French um, uh, from a different mummy. He's part French. But um, I, I love this song and I, I think it's it, it just it's just beautiful. And for a cultured mind, uh, even for an uncultured mind, if you can, it touches the soul. And I think that's the I think this is what people people a lot of people don't understand is that if you believe you have a soul, then this piece will touch it. Well, you'd better do the pronunciation because uh, I'll only mangle it. Tell, <laughs> tell us what it is. Oh my goodness me! What in an East End accent? Uh, Cantalube, Chance de Avon, Bolero. Not bad, I think. Not bad. That's the final choice of our guest, Gary Allen. Gary, thank you so much thank for being so our much. Tuesday guest this week. It's been a week. pleasure. Thank you. thank you so much.
The home of the Canaries. BBC Radio Norfolk Sport. With Rob Butler. Norwich had equalised. What an utterly amazing team they are. And Norwich on tour. This is almost fantasy football. What a good one from McKenzie. It's and he's in. Oh, it's a header. It's in there. Oh, it's Adam Drury. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. He's got the equaliser. Grant Holt writes his name in Norwich City folklore in permanent marker. He scored a hat-trick on Derby Day. He's completed it in front of the Barkley. Nathan Redmond with a shot from the end goal. Oh, my goodness, it's two. It's two. And Norwich City have taken this playoff final by the scruff of the neck. It's a bonus night of live football for you lucky listeners tonight. Norwich City's under-23s begin their checker trade trophy campaign at Peterborough United. Full live coverage of the match coming up, plus the very latest transfer news with just 24 hours to go till the window shuts. Welcome to the programme, it's Rob Butler here with you until 10 o'clock, we are going into the unknown tonight, the first time that an under-23 side for Norwich City has headed into the Checker Trade Trophy. I quite like saying that, it kind of rolls off the tongue. Let's uh, head over to where we are tonight, we're at Peterborough United, London Road, Chris Gorham as always of course is there for us and he's got the team news. Yes, what an intriguing night. Welcome to the EFL Trophy, the Checker Trade Trophy, if you want to give it its full uh, sponsor's name. Uh, we're looking around. I, I don't think this one has particularly caught the imagination that the signs weren't good when we arrived at the ground today, uh, Rob, and that the man in charge of the press passes was perturbed that the hot dog stand that is always here for Peterborough games hadn't turned up. So it's not a big enough game. I'm glad for I didn't come then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a big enough game for Peterborough to have a hot dog stand in the car park. But we do have the team news. Um, it is for Peterborough. This is a first team competition because they play in, in League One. Uh, for Norwich City, it's an under 23s competition, but they are allowed to name three overage players, although they've only named one, if uh, that makes sense. So here's the Norwich team, first of all. Ben Killip is the goalkeeper. Uh, Lewis Ramsey will play at right back with Michi Afiti and Ben Godfrey in the centre of defence. Harry Toffolo is the left back. Lewis Thompson and Ray Grant we expect to see in the middle of midfield. Tony Andrew playing on the right. Josh Murphy on the left and James Madison behind Carlton Morris set in attack. So Tony Andrew comfortably the oldest member of this Norwich City team at the age of 28. The subs are Ashton Oxborough, the goalkeeper, uh, Todd Cantwell, Benny Ashley Seal, Joe Crow, Glenn Middleton, uh, Dialang Jessimi and Ibu Adams. That is the Norwich City line up for this game. Uh, an interesting one, I think, Rob, players like Michael Turner, Sebastian Bassong, who haven't had much of a run out at all this season. We, we wonder whether this might be an opportunity to give them a bit of football, but BBC clearly not. Radio they're they're not Norfolk. anywhere to be seen amongst the Norwich City squad uh, tonight. OK, well, with you tonight is, of course, Jamie Curiton, uh, the Norwich City legend, still playing for Farm. 